Anyway, it's been quite a few years ago now that the Lord impressed me if I had the opportunity to only speak one Bible study that was probably the most important thing, had meant the most to me more than anything else. Without hesitation, I really believe uh, this is what I would be teaching tonight. Uh, this has had the most life-changing effect on me other than Psalm 91 than anything else that I've ever had. Now, I'm convinced that this little bit of information now <clears throat> that I'm going to be sharing with you out of the Word, I'm convinced that it can make the difference in success and failure in, in the life of any Christian. It doesn't matter whether they've been a Christian a long time in the ministry or whether it's just somebody coming into the ministry. Because I believe without reservation that when you hear this today, if you'll just nail it down, <clears throat> it can make a permanent, irrevocable quality, uh, quality uh, decision. Good, come in. <laughs> um, uh, that can literally change our life. Now, this is more than a testimony. It's not exactly a Bible study, but it's still more than a testimony. It has become something that when God revealed it to us, it literally changed my life and it changed our family. We just, we took it and we ran with it. <clears throat> now, I'm believing this message can revolutionize your lives. And most of you have heard it, but you'll just get a little... Uh, uh, uplift on it now. It's been quite a few years ago that I woke up one morning and I was quoting, those who trust the Lord shall not be disappointed. Now, to my knowledge, I never had remembered seeing that in the Bible. I didn't know whether, whether it was a scripture or not. But all day long, I just kept confessing, those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. And by afternoon, I realized uh, God was trying to tell me something. He was trying to get my attention. And it finally dawned on me that God was giving me something important that I needed. It, it was going to be very important in the future. And so I just kept thinking, those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. And I looked it up in the King James. Now, I had found it in the New American Version. But in the King James, it said, those who trust the Lord shall not be uh, ashamed. But when I looked it up in the Greek, I found it, that it meant ashamed, disappointed, confounded, or confused. But the Lord was dealing with me in just that one area. He was dealing with me in the area of disappointment. So over the next few days now, the Lord began to show me that most Christians never go on to get the total victory simply because at some point they get disappointed. At some point they come to a place where they, uh, something disappoints them and uh, at first maybe they don't even think about God being involved, but for, before it's over, they slip that disappointment over onto God and they think God let them down in some area. And subconsciously, they just feel like, well, God, God wasn't with me in this, in this area. Now, the Lord <clears throat> took me on a search through the Word, and the very first scripture that I found that He talk, took me to was Matthew 11, verse 6, where it says, Blessed is he who does not stumble because of me. Now, I had always believed God that I wouldn't stumble, but I didn't see what it had to do with disappointment until he took me to the next scripture where it said in 1 Peter 2, verse 6, he's, Peter's quoting out of the Old Testament, and it says, For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who trusts in him should not be disappointed. Well, I'm going to tell you what. When I saw that God had taken me supernaturally to that very scripture, <clears throat> boy, I tell you what, I was ready to dance a jig. I was so excited. And then it went on in that uh, same scripture to say, now this precious value is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve are those who don't trust him. It says that the stone, which the builders rejected, became the very cornerstone, and it became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. In other words, when they received the word and they didn't receive it, then instead of it being a blessing, it became a, a rock of offense. And all of a sudden then, <clears throat> I realized why Matthew 11, verse 6 said, Blessed is he who does not stumble because of me. Matthew was saying, Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord, because that's where we don't stumble. And I realized that what it had to do with disappointment. Now, this scripture in 1 Peter 2 very plainly was saying, He who trusts in me it will not be disappointed. But then it goes right on to say, But if he doesn't trust in me, then not only is he going to become disappointed, but the rock, Jesus, the word, is going to become a stone of stumbling. It's going to be a stumbling block. And um, boy, I tell you what, I, I started thinking about that and I thought, okay, when I concentrate on disappointment and um, 
that's going to lead me in a direction I don't want to go. <laughs> and I realized God was saying it's in choosing to determine in my heart I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm just not going to be. That will bring me into the kind of trust that's going to keep me from stumbling. And so I want to say that one more time because this is so important. But any time that we choose not to be disappointed, we make up our minds, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to be disappointed in anything, but I'm certainly not going to be disappointed in the Word. It brings us into a trust, and it's a certain kind of trust that will keep us from ever stumbling. Now, I came to realize that trusting God is going to take in more than just our eternal salvation. Now, we start there. Trusting is going to start with the new birth. But a person, if they're not trusting in God in every single area of life, there's going to come a time when he's going to get disappointed, and then it's going to move over. He's going to be disappointed in God about something. Now, it may be conscious or it may be subconscious, but when he becomes disappointed in God, then the word every single time will become a stumbling block. In other words, uh, what, what we're trusting in, what we're reading, some way it's, it's going to cause us to stumble rather than move on in him. And um, so I didn't want to stumble. And when the Lord started showing me this, I was ready to hear anything that God had to show me about disappointment. So I started to search through the Word of God, and I found that all through the Word of God, He reiterated this same topic over and over and over. I couldn't believe it. Those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. Twice, Paul uh, quoted the very same, uh, in the very same letter, he quoted it in uh, Romans 9, verse 33. He quoted again in Romans 10, verse 11. Those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. And I thought, my goodness, he wanted them to hear it, to say it twice in the same letter. And he was quoting out of Isaiah 28, verse 16. And that in the Hebrew uh, was saying, those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. But also some of your translations will say, those who trust in the Lord will not be disturbed or will not be confounded, because it means those three things. Disturbed, confounded, disappointed. But disappointment now was in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. So I realized God was really trying to get my attention. Now in Psalm 22, verse 5, it says, In thee they trusted, and they were not disappointed. I found this same truth reiterated over and over and over in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. <clears throat> and many of those times, it wasn't just uh, giving you the impression. Many times it was a direct quote verbatim, Those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed. And so I realized... God's really trying to get this truth across to us for him to say it that many times. Because when you think about most of the truths that God gives us, he doesn't say them over and over and over. But this one was over and over in the Old and New Testament. And I realized that there, I don't know of any other promises quoted verbatim that many times. So I really started saying, okay, God, I really want to know what you're trying to tell me. I, I need to get this inside of me. And I knew in my spirit that it was something that was going to be very important to me, something that I needed. And I remember thinking, but God, I think I do trust you. But there's times maybe when I get a little bit disappointed, but Lord, that doesn't mean I'm not trusting you. Have you ever argued with God? <laughs> and so I kept telling him, Lord, I don't think that means that I'm not trusting you. And uh, the Lord began to show me <clears throat> that Many times we don't realize when, when we get into that disappointment, it is pulling us away from God. And uh, so all of a sudden I quit my argument and the Lord began to show me that trust and disappointment are exact opposites. They're exact opposites. Just like fear and faith are opposites. They can't work together. Well, we're going to find out that uh, disappointment and trust absolutely can't work at the same time. Now, he showed me that every single time that I got into disappointment, I wasn't trusting him. And I thought back about it, and I thought, hmm, that's right. When, when I'm disappointed, I'm certainly not trusting in God. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I really got serious, and I got on my face, and I started saying, God, I want you to tell me everything I need to hear about disappointment. And the Lord showed me that I might get tempted at times, but if, if I don't fall for it, I'm fine. We'll all be tempted to be disappointed, but that's when we need to stop it. Absolutely stop it right at the door. Okay, now I want you to notice how it's stated. It stated, those who trust shall not be disappointed. So 
Notice that the trusting is present tense. We're trusting right now. But the shall not be disappointed, that's future tense, when we finally then see the results and we're truly not disappointed. We realize, oh God, I didn't see it that way, but I'm not disappointed. So this is a promise with a condition that if we trust and we continue to trust, we don't lay it down, present tense, the time will come every single time that we will literally not be disappointed in the outcome. Now, it doesn't say that we won't have opportunities. We're going to have a lot of opportunities to be disappointed, sometimes several opportunities a day. But I promise you, when we get there, if we'll stop and realize, okay, this is an opportunity to be disappointed, so I know this is coming from the enemy, and I have to realize that the ball's in my court now, and I have a decision to make. I can either fall for the flesh, get into that disappointment, or I can put my foot down and say, God, I'm trusting you. Don't know how you're going to work this out, but I'm not going to be disappointed. Now, at that point, you're going to have to decide. It, 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 you may just have a split second to do it, but you'll have to decide, am I going to fall for this opportunity or am I going to put my foot down? Am I going to determine in my heart, Lord, I am trusting you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it looks like you, you let me down. I am not going to allow disappointment to come in. And... Uh, it makes it a lot easier when we realize that God has already warned us ahead of time that these opportunities are going to come and we're going to have a choice to make. And he's already told us which way to go. I've noticed that in the Old Testament. He would tell the children of Israel what was going to come up and then he didn't just tell them you're going to have a choice to make. Every time then he told them what choice to make. He didn't just leave them at their own <clears throat> uh, decision. Well, that's what he's doing here. He's telling us, you're going to have a choice here. Now, trust me, and then the time will come you won't be disappointed. See, if I refuse to accept disappointment, and if I continue to trust, no matter how hard it is, God promises us that he will intervene, and when he intervenes, the time comes that we'll see he'll, him work everything together for good, and we won't be disappointed in the outcome. Now, that boggles my mind. I can remember when he first started giving this to me, and I thought, can this be true? Can it be true that every time I trust him, the time will come that I won't be disappointed? And um, I thought, okay, Lord, you've said it too many times in the Word. I'm going to have to trust this. And so this is literal. But the trusting is the prerequisite now before we'll ever see the outcome. So I began to pray, and I said, Lord, show me how I can know if I'm really trusting you. And sometimes when I ask God questions, he'll just give me a little phrase, just uh, just a little sharp phrase will come up out of my spirit. But I know God's telling me something that I better grab hold of. And so this time, when I asked him that question, he just simply said, turn it around. That's all he said to me. And I thought about that for a good while. But he showed me that it was when I allowed myself to wallow in feelings of disappointment. And boy, we want to. When something happens and disappointment's there, the thing you want to do more than anything, your feelings want to just wallow in that disappointment for just a little while. And, uh, <clears throat> but he reminded me, the minute I let myself wallow in the disappointment, that means I'm not operating in trust. And we do. We try to make trust so hard. But God said trust is just so easy. We don't have to muster up faith, you know. We don't have to feel that faith. And so many times that's what we're doing. We're trying to struggle and strive to get our, our faith worked up. But he reminded me that faith is just simply a decision to believe God. That's all it takes. Lord, I just choose to believe you. And we don't have to feel anything. I was so used to depending on my feelings. And when you look in the Word of God, it does, there's no place in the Word that tells you you have to feel anything. Now, trust is a quality decision where we say, Lord, I don't care what this situation looks like. <clears throat> I don't care what my reasoning is screaming in my ear. I don't even care if it looks like you didn't come through. I don't care what the world is saying. You know, I don't care what the reports are saying, the doctor reports or the internet. I don't care what they're saying. I don't care what my emotions are dictating. From this moment on, I'm going to trust what you tell me. And I can remember the night that I sat down and went through that list, you know, and I said, okay, Lord, I've made, I've made up my mind. From this day forth, I'm gonna to choose to trust you. He even told me that he didn't want me to use the word disappointment when I'm talking about something that didn't even have anything to do with him. He said, take disappointment out of your vocabulary because disappointment, he said, is such an uh, a enemy 
to the living God. It's such an enemy to the Word of God. And so this, what he was telling me to do, was just a quality decision where I just came to the point where I said, Lord, I've made up my mind from this day forth that the Word's going to be my final authority. And we all have to come to that place and just uh, put a stake in the ground, you know, from this day forth, the Word's going to be my final authority. I'm going to choose to be obedient, Lord, to do anything you tell me to do. But as far as I'm concerned, Lord, the case is closed. And from now on then, I'm going to choose to trust you and the rest is up to you. And I remember the day that I did that, it was just like a weight lifted off of me. And I'm not saying I haven't been tempted, but I'm saying I've done pretty good about, boy, when, when I realized disappointment staring me in the face, it's been a lot easier to say, uh-uh, Lord, I'm not going there, you know. So it's a quality decision, as simple as it sounds, and we don't have to feel anything. It's just an act of our will. It's not an act of our emotions. It's just a decision. It's a choice that we make. Now, the Lord gave me a simple little statement that I was supposed to say out loud every time I was faced with the opportunity to be disappointed. And he said that I was just simply to say, Lord, in this particular situation, and then I was supposed to name it, whatever it was I was facing, I choose to trust you. I'm going to tell you something. I don't think I would be exaggerating to tell you that I've probably said that little statement 10,000 times. <laughs> Lord, in this particular situation, and I'd name it, I choose to trust you. Because we face so many, so many things every day. The enemy sees to it that we face opportunity after opportunity. Now, when I say out loud, Lord, I'm trusting you in this situation and name it, I can literally feel faith start to, to bubble up. I can, I can feel that trust. It's just like something kind of lifts up on the inside. Now, <clears throat> it's not, you're not going to be able to help when you have thoughts come, and they'll come knocking at your door. You're going to have a lot of thoughts come in and say, uh, oh, what about this and what about that? Uh, you might have some fear thoughts. You may have some doubt thoughts. I promise you'll have some what-if thoughts. And, um, but we can decide whatever that little thought that comes, stop it at the door. Once we take it in and we think through, we start to think through the situation and, and mull over, you know, I wonder why this is not working. You know, why this or why that? And the moment we can do that, it doesn't take but two seconds, and out goes the trust, and in comes the disappointment every single time. Now, those thoughts will come. Just stop them at the door. And uh, because the minute we let them in, I can promise you, at that moment, the rock will come, become a stumbling block. It, it'll be a rock of stumbling. Now, I'm giving you life and death uh, information today. I can promise you it, it can literally bring life and death to different situations, and it'll cause us to take a huge detour in our walk. Now, I'm not talking about positive thinking. A lot of uh, Christians and non-Christians like they run to positive thinking. You know, I'm just going to think positively about this. But that's not what God's telling us to do. It's choosing to trust to the extent that we develop such an expectancy that we expect God's word to work. We expect him to do exactly what he promises to do. Now, I'm not talking about a passive trust. That's not what I'm talking about. Some people uh, think of trust as just being passive. You know, oh, oh, God, I'm just trusting you. I I'm just, I'm fine, Lord, I'm just trusting you. That's passive and it doesn't work. That's not really faith. So uh, I'm talking about a trust where we say, Lord, I'm trusting you and I know that the time's going to come that I'm not going to be disappointed because your word tells me that over and over and over through the Old and New Testament. And so if I'm not going to be disappointed in the future at some point, then I'm going to lay the disappointment down now. I, I don't have to even entertain it now. Now, we're not talking about mind over matter where we think, oh, I'm, I'm just going to refuse to think about it and maybe it'll go away. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about, oh, okay, if I just kind of endure, the time's going to come that I'll have forgotten how, how strong this was. Uh, I'm talking about a supernatural intervention. This particular uh, verse. I think all of God's promises are supernatural, but this one is really supernatural. Something supernatural takes place when we put it to work. Now, God is saying those who trust in the Lord shall not be disappointed, literally. Well, over the next year, I woke up practically every morning with that coming out of my mouth. I mean, I wasn't even trying to remember it. Lord, those who trust the Lord shall not be disappointed. So, Lord, today I'm trusting you. And it became such a household phrase that 
every time something came up, within, with, that's when the kids were living at home, and anything that came up, well, one of us in the family would say, uh-uh, we're, we're trusting God. We're not going to be disappointed. So we, we were batting it back and forth, and it really became Rhema in our household. I hope the kids are still remembering it. It was, it was fun at the time we were doing it. <clears throat> now I'm going to share some of the examples because God immediately started intervening and gave me opportunity after opportunity. And boy, he will. The minute we start saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you, not going to allow disappointment in, you'll immediately have that challenge. It's your opportunity to do it right. And every time we do it right, we grow. Now, <clears throat> these examples... Uh, kind of will help it come alive. But we felt like the Lord was telling us to build a house out in the country. And he told us that we were supposed to pay as we go, not to go in debt for it. And that we were to look to him to supply everything we needed. Well, that seemed pretty supernatural, but Jack really felt like that's what God had told him. Now, this house became such a training ground. I couldn't believe what a training ground it became that we all said when it was over with, the house was just a fringe benefit. What we learned in the training ground was what, what we needed. And um, we're going to find that anything that we go through, if we'll do it right, it can become a, a training ground. It's, a, it's an area where we can grow spiritually. And it can be something tiny or it can be something big. But if we, every time we do it right, you know, we're, we're building ground. Now, <clears throat> only good gifts come from God. But he will take even those things that are meant for evil, even those things that, uh, you know, that, that were sent to do us harm. He'll take those if we'll give them to him, and he'll turn them around and use them for good. And it's just our choice again if we're willing to let him do that. Now, God gave Jack the plans for the house. We never had an architect. And, uh, of course, the house is really large. It's about 3,000 square feet downstairs. And it took three and a half years to build it. And uh, it would not be an exaggeration to say that, that literally we had miracles happen every single day. And uh, uh, when the foundation was laid and the plumbing had been uh, completed, uh, most of you, I doubt even y'all are old enough to know about the old Swift turkey plant. Did y'all know about that? Well, any, anyway, we had a Swift turkey plant that was uh, probably went into business about the turn of the century. So, I mean, it was just, I mean, you didn't think of Brownwood without talk, thinking about that swift turkey plant. And uh, <clears throat> so they were tearing it down, and they were going to auction off all the lumber. Well, Jack was at work, and he couldn't go to the auction. So he said, you know, that would be so nice to have that lumber. And so Dad said, okay, I'll go down. And when Jack got off work that afternoon, of course, we jumped in the car and took off down there. And Daddy was the only one left on the lot. And the lot was covered with huge mounds of, of lumber. And uh, I, I mean, two, two or three men high. And we walked up and there were mounds all over the property. And he just waved his hand like that and he said, I bought it all. <laughs> you know? And so anyway, we got excited because we knew we were gonna have plenty of lumber to build that house, you know. And, but then he said, the lot has to be cleared off in three days. He said, they have a bulldozer. And we saw the bulldozer. It was sitting there. And uh, he said, they're going to bulldoze it because someone had already bought the property. And, um, uh, of course, all, all the boards still had nails in them. That's why it was, the boards were just laying in every direction because they had uh, nails. I counted the nails in one of the really long boards, 120 nails in one board. And uh, they were all different size nails in it. And um, also those boards were too long to go in the back end of our pickup. You couldn't even think about getting them in there. And so Jack and I, boy, immediately started our prayer again. Father, in this particular situation, we have all this wonderful lumber that you supplied, but there's no way to get it off the lot in three days. There just wasn't. Uh, nevertheless, Lord, we're choosing to trust you and we're not going to be disappointed. We'll talk about an important impossible looking situation. Uh, the sight was mind boggling. Uh, but when Jack finished praying, God just impressed him and he just, God spoke to him in his spirit, told him to go to Santa Ana, because you all know it's just not but about 20 miles away. And uh, 
and he spoke to him and he told him, you're going to find a harvest gold 16 foot long cattle trailer with a bulldog hitch. I thought it was interesting that he even told about the hitch and it will cost under a thousand dollars. Well, my daddy just almost had a fit when, when we told him we were going to look for a, a trailer. He said, we've got three days and you're going to take off on a trip trying to find, find a trailer. But Jack knew we couldn't do it. In the, we couldn't even get those boards in the back end of the pickup. Um, I can't say that I had much faith for that, uh, that miracle, but I was really telling God, Lord, I believe what you told Jack. <laughs> I'm trusting you there. Well, we drove over there and we found the, the car lot and um, we, found, we could see the Harvest Gold uh, trailer and, and we only har Harvest Gold trailer on the lot. And um, no one was around and so we had to make a, a, a number of phone calls before we finally, finally found the owner. And he came over there. He sold it to us for $975 under the, under the $1,000 mark. And so Jack told him, he said, this trailer is, is a really nice trailer. He said, I would have thought that it would have cost more than that. And he said, oh, my goodness. He said, I'm closing out this particular brand because he said, I'm going to carry a much cheaper line of trailers. But he said, this is the last one I had, and so I'm just getting rid of it for $9.75. And we hadn't even told him that we had to get it under $1,000. Okay, now with that miracle under our belt then, uh, and, and it, it was just like that, harvest gold, it was 16 foot long, and it had the bulldog hitch. And we spent every moment of daylight for the next three days. Actually, we went way into the dark and uh, hauling lumber trip after trip after trip in this new um, trailer. And we finished literally, it, it was like a couple of hours before uh, they said, you know, time's up. Now, no one could believe the superior quality of this old lumber. You know, new lumber would have warped so badly, you know, laying the way it was laying, piled in every direction, and we had to leave it for three months because it took three months for me to get all the nails out of those boards. And, uh, uh, but the reason it didn't uh, warp or do anything is because it had been cured for over 100 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> it had been, you know, uh, and, and I mean, Jack, and the, you know, where you see a two before today, the two before is not two by four. Right. It's less than two inches and less than four inches. These were full two inches and full four inches. When they said a two before, that's what we were getting. There was enough lumber to frame out the entire house. Uh, then not only that, but God just knew what we were going to need. There was enough tongue and groove oak lumber to deck the second floor. So it made a real solid second floor up there. And uh, that was all two by four. So it's, that made it really nice. Well, by the time we finished, we had all the lumber we possibly needed. And plus we had enough that we gave enough to two people to build um, an extra room. They wanted to build an extra room and somebody wanted to build a garage. And so three different people had enough lumber to build what they needed. And we couldn't help but think about 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 where it says, I'll give you a sufficiency for all of your needs and an abundance left over for every good deed. And so anyway, Jack laughed. He said, God gave us that abundance for a good need. We knew that we would need our bricks really early on in construction because uh, we weren't just using them for the outside. We were going to use them uh, as the inside walls on the first floor to actually hold up the second floor. And uh, uh, we weren't really concerned about getting bricks because we had gone to the brick company early on and he had said, hey, I, I don't even need a full week's notice. When you get ready, you just come tell me what you want and we can have them to you within a week. So... We had been so busy with the project that we hadn't noticed all the new construction going on all over the state of Texas. So when we went to pick out, to get our bricks, he said, oh my goodness, no, we've got a six month waiting period. Uh, he said, uh, you know, he, he said, there's no way I can br get bricks for you. Well, now if it had been bricks for the outside of the house, that would have been fine. We could have just put tar paper. But since we needed those bricks on the inside, we knew that all that wooden framework because because you're gonna I mean there's you know what all you put in there um, we knew that it just wasn't gonna work in the weather uh, for that six month waiting period so in desperation we called uh, uh, we asked the manager 
uh, if we could pay a premium, premium and get ours earlier. Well, another word for that is we tried to bribe him. Is what we did, uh, you know. And Jack said the moment that those words came out of his mouth, he said he wanted to grab them and stuff them back in. He said he knew that you know he had stepped across the line. Well, the manager was so angry, and he said, "I don't do business that way." And Jack apologized and apologized, and he said, well, you know what? I don't do business that way either. And he said, I am so sorry. He said, I, I apologize. Well, we went home. I can't even tell you how discouraged we were, you know. And uh, uh, because it, it looked impossible. And so we started calling different places all over Texas, and they all told us the same thing. You're not going to get any bricks. You can just forget that. And... Um, but we finally dawned us, okay, God's promise. You know, it's funny how you can forget the very thing that God's told you. And Jack said, we haven't even prayed. So we started confessing, Lord, we're trusting you in this impossible looking situation. Needing these bricks and needing them. Uh, but you've promised us, Lord, that we're not going to be disappointed. So we're going to trust you. Well, the next morning, Jack always would go outside. He had a, a bench down there overlooking the tank. And he would go down there every morning and pray. And he came back and he said, I'm supposed to go back to the lumber yard and apologize to the manager again. And I said, Jack, you apologized and apologized yesterday. You kept apologizing. And he heard you. Why would you need to go back and do it again? And um, so Jack said, I, I don't know. But God told me to go back and do it again. Well, I didn't go with him. I thought, we apologized enough yesterday. I don't want to embarrass myself again. <laughs> so anyway, Jack went, and he said when he got there, uh, the manager was dealing with some other people, but he just acted like he didn't even notice Jack. And so Jack just waited around, and finally he came over, and Jack told him, he said, I came back just to apologize again for yesterday. He said, uh, I, I really am uh, embarrassed over trying to offer a bribe. And the guy didn't even answer him. He just said, I have your bricks. And so Jack said that it took about 60 seconds. It was like he was ready to say something else. And he thought, what? <laughs> you know, and he, he couldn't take it in. And in a minute, he said, what did you say? And the guy said, I have your bricks. Well, we found out that right after we had left the day before, uh, a church in Waco, Texas, about 150 miles away, had called just as we had left out and... Um, uh, told them wh what they had said. They, had start, they were doing an expansion program and they were going to build a big uh, recreational or something building behind their church. And they were ready to start on it and they realized the bricks that they had bought a number of months before, I think about six months before, didn't match the existing building well enough. And they thought, oh, this is going to be ugly. And so they had called and... Um, uh, they had asked if they could exchange their bricks and get something that matched better. And so he told them, well, they're cost a lot more. And they said, no, we don't mind that. And he said, well, it's going to be at least a six-month waiting period. Okay, we don't mind that. And uh, so the, the brick company had quit making that particular brick, the brick that they had bought. So when uh, Jack came in, the manager offered him the bricks that, uh, that they wanted to return. He said, I'll give them, if you'll take all of them, I'll give them to you at last year's price. So sight unseen, without even knowing how many bricks we needed, I, I was teasing Jack at the time. I said, Jack, they may be orange. <laughs> anyway, so we laughed about that. Uh, but Jack told him, yes, we'll take them. And we knew that a miracle of that magnitude had to be from God. <laughs> we, we weren't worried about that. So from that church in Waco to our doorstep, two huge truckloads. I mean, we're not talking about a pickup. We're talking truck. Uh, were delivered the very next day. We didn't even have to reschedule the bricklayer. And we had been able to get uh, the bricklayer at the time was the best bricklayer in Brownwood. Everybody wanted this. He was an older man. And everybody said, you have a, there's a waiting list. Well, no one could get bricks. And so we had been able... Uh, when we called him, yes, he'd be happy to lay our bricks. So we had the best bricklayer in Brownwood and um, didn't have to even schedule, reschedule him uh, without having even a clue how many bricks we needed. Of course, we were, had to take all they had anyway. But when we finished the walls and the columns and the, uh, everything, uh, 
we had about 300 bricks left over when it was over with. I mean, about enough to build a barbecue pit. And so truly, oh, when we trusted God, we were not disappointed. Now, another part of that miracle was that if Jack had not gone back, if he hadn't obeyed God when God told him to go back and apologize again, that manager didn't know our name. And the reason he didn't know our name is because we didn't give him our name. We were embarrassed. <laughs> so we had not used our name. And uh, so he couldn't have gotten a hold of us even if he had wanted to. And so those who trust the Lord shall not be disappointed. And I, I thought so many times, I, even if God had told me to go back, I probably wouldn't have. I would have thought, oh, no, I apologized enough the day before. But thank goodness, Jack was obedient, and he went back. He was willing to go apologize again. Now, when it came time to put the carpet down, that really seemed impossible uh, because we'd made that promise to God that we would pay as we go, and we needed 500 yards of carpet. Well, I wanted carpet. By this time, we were really getting involved in the church, and uh, we hadn't built the church yet, but I mean, uh, we were meeting uh, in a... Uh, uh, different places in town every time we'd find a place. We actually met for a long time in an aerobics center that was all glassed in. And so every Sunday, uh, of course, we were spirit-filled and most of the churches in town were um, denominational, uh, yeah, uh, is it called just denominational churches? Yeah. There, okay. So anyway, we would watch people who wanted to come to our church and try it out. And they would come and they'd look in both directions and they're running that, <laughs> run in. But it was, it was all mirrors. All the walls were mirrors. And so that was an interesting experience. But anyway, we, we were there until we started building our building. But uh, we needed 500 yards of carpet. We wanted carpet that was going to wear well. And um, uh, because we knew by this time we were going to be using uh, our house for a lot of church events. And then just about the time... Uh, I had gone to look early. I, I started looking everywhere in all the carpet places. And I was about ready to give up. And uh, I thought, there is no way we're going to be able to, to pay for this, that amount, this amount of carpet, you know, and, and, and not uh, pay it out. Well, this little carpet place came into business, and they decided that they would do us a favor. And they said that uh, we could order through them discontinued carpet, from a carpet mill in Georgia, and we were able to get the exact carpet that we loved. And it was the exact color. It was just exactly what I wanted. It was one-fifth of the price. I had to keep that ticket to, to prove it to myself. One-fifth of the regular price. And um, now they assured us that this was not seconds. He said, this is top quality. It's just discontinued. Well, we got the carpet about six months before it was time to lay it. And so what we did is... Uh, it was rolled, big rolls, covered in white canvas. And so we pulled back the edge of the canvas and looked, and it was exactly what we wanted. And so we just stored those big four rolls over in the corner of the den. And um, uh, so anyway, when it, when it was time uh, to, to have the carpet laid, Jack felt like he was supposed to hire this father-son team. And they were higher than the other team. And we didn't know them personally. So Jack said he thought it was strange, but he said, I know God's telling me to get them. And um, so the day they came, I, we were working outside, and I had already made up my mind. I'm not going in until it's completely finished. Of course, I didn't realize they weren't going to be able to finish it in one day. But anyway, I was going to wait. And all of a sudden, this guy comes outside, and he said, um, I think you need to come inside. We've got a little problem. You've got purple spots on your carpet. And so I just laughed because I thought he was kidding with me. And he said, no, I'm serious. Well, we went inside. He had laid out one roll of carpet in the big den area. And it was all rolled out. And ever so often, there was a purple spot. And I just, you know, I, I looked and I, I just, you know, for a minute, you see something like that and you just think you can't believe it. You know, you think surely something. And um, I could feel those tears began to well up in my eyes, you know. And so he very quickly assured me, he said, don't have to worry, uh, this, uh, they'll take the carpet back, it's damaged, you don't have to worry about it, you'll get your money back. 
Well, what he didn't know is that during that six months, that little carpet company had gone out of business. They had moved. They didn't leave any kind of a forwarding address because I'd already checked downtown and was shocked to find out they were gone, you know. And um, we knew it was a carpet mill in Georgia. We had no idea what the name. So we looked on that white canvas thinking, surely it's going to have a name on it, which it didn't. You know, so we had our carpet, they had their money, and we had not thought about there being a problem. But there was a problem, you know. And so uh, I could tell Jack was as upset as I was. And um, so Jack told the father-son team, he said, go home, we're going to have to pray and come back tomorrow. And they were Christians. And so um, we started quoting our scripture through tears, you know. We started saying, oh, God, you know, we are trusting you with with these purple spots in our, our carpet. We can't take the carpet back. We're trusting you. We're not going to be disappointed. We're not going to use that word. Well, the next day they came back and Jack told him, he said, I've been praying. He said, I haven't gotten anything. I'm just, I'm really believing God's going to show you something to do. And uh, we knew why we got the Christian team because I guarantee you some of the other guys, they were just, a lot of them were young kids and they'd have just left, you know, they wouldn't have stayed around to help us. And, um, but this father-son team, they went over in the corner <clears throat> and they talked for uh, about an hour. And then they got up and they started measuring through the house. Now, of course, y'all have seen it. We've got hallways and some of the rooms are wider at one end and they narrow down. And so uh, they got up and they measured everything. And then they started laying the measurements down on the carpet, just like you'd put patterns on, on a piece of material. And of course, it all had to go in the same direction. And they kept moving that, those measurements around until finally they had moved them and got them where all of the purple spots were ending in the part that was going to be cut off and thrown away. And uh, of course, that had to be done. We didn't know how many of the rows were going to have purple spots. But we just thought, oh, boy, it works this time. God, you know, help us. And um, so anyway... Uh, they told us that they were going to have to have one row that had no purple spots in it for the big den area. So they said, you, you've got to have one row. Well, as they kept opening them, uh, the first three rows had purple spots, all, all, all three of the, those. And so uh, when they were opening that r last row, by this time we had a bunch of friends who had come out because they were right along with us, you know, believing with us. And... Uh, when that last row was being opened, I promise you, I don't think any of us breathed. I don't think anybody in the room breathed. <laughs> and uh, uh, when that last row was open, it did not have a purple spot in it. How did three rows have purple spots and one not? I mean, you, you knew it was God, you know. And uh, it took all 550 yards. If they had sent the 500 yards that we ordered, it wouldn't have been enough. But the 550 was exactly enough. So God had given us what we needed and... Uh, uh, we didn't even have to pay for the extra 50 yards. <laughs> that was just thrown in. Now, there were times when by sight, I tell you what, it, the sight was so strong and the negative that it was almost literally felt like you were pulling your teeth. You know, when you have miracles happening, you would think, oh, ev everything's fine now. But it seemed like each new opportunity was bigger than the last one, <laughs> you know. And you'd think, oh, no, not another one. What, what are we facing now, you know. And so each time you had to stand and not yield to the temptation because the temptation was there every time. But with each new opportunity now, God, every time he, uh, he would remind us again, you know, Lord, we're trusting you. We're not going to be disappointed. But our mind was screaming, you know, uh, Lord, how on earth are you going to work this one out? This is bigger than all the rest of them put together. You know, that's what you think. And, but how God does it, that's really none of our business. Our part is just that we have to trust him. We have to make sure he's not telling us something that we were to do uh, because sometimes there's a, a place of obedience. And then we have to determine. The big thing was determining, Lord, I'm not going to be disappointed. Don't know how you're going to work this out, but we're not going to be disappointed. And God's part is bringing it to pass. And we could never, we never once knew ahead of time how God was going to do it. We just, you couldn't figure it out. But the trusting had to come first every single time. Now, that statement, shall not be disappointed, that is literal, you know. He's not talking about dulling the pain. He's saying, I'm going to intervene, but you're going to have to trust me until, 
until it comes to pass. Now, I kept a diary. I wasn't even keeping a diary back then, but boy, I kept a diary through all this, and I was thankful I did <laughs> to write a book. But anyway, each time looked a little harder, a little more difficult than the time before. And sometimes you get really weary when you're in the middle of it, you know, and especially when you're doing the work yourself. Now, Jack was holding down a full-time job, and he was building the house. Uh, Bill was helping him. And, uh, <clears throat> but we saw God come through time after time. And with each, t each time, I'm embarrassed to say that each time, it, you wanted to throw the towel in and quit, you know. Uh, but when those thoughts start bombarding, it's more important than ever to, we have to run to God and not away from him. And the Lord showed us that most people, when they face something that looks like a disappointment, the biggest thing people do is they pull back from him. They run back from him. And one of the big things God taught us, he said, I want you to run as hard as you can run into my arms when, when you are tempted to be disappointed. And uh, he said, don't pull back from me because he said, if you pull back, you'll get into disappointment. But if you run toward me, you won't. And, uh, <clears throat> um, and future tense, I can say this, we were never disappointed. Sometimes we had to wait a couple of hours, you know, for something to work out. There were times we had to wait a couple of months, but we had a few things. We had to wait a couple of years before we actually saw it uh, work out and come to pass. But the time came every single time that we weren't disappointed. And then we learned during that <clears throat> time that sometimes God's answers come in progressive steps. Now that was the one that was the hardest for me because sometimes it would look like it had worked out. We're trusting you, Lord, and boy, it looked like it worked out. And then all of a sudden, oh no, it didn't work. And you, want to, you really want to throw the towel in. But Bill, of course, he's grown now. But this was when he was in the sixth grade. And he started praying and believing God for a horse right in the middle of when we're trying to build the house. And Jack really tried to discourage him because we thought, we don't have the money, you know, we don't want him to be disappointed. But he dogmatically came in and insisted that God had told him that he was going to give him a horse. He said, Dad, God told me he was going to give me a horse. And he, told, he said, Dad, God told me three things. He said it would be a Palomino. He said it would be a good riding horse. And he said, somebody's going to come to know the Lord because of the horse. Well, Jack and I were both very skeptical, you know, about that last reason. Sounded like that was a little bit manipulative, you know. But it turned out to be an unbelievable story. There was a man, we'd never heard of him, he lived in Del Rio. Of course, that's about 300 miles from Brownwood. And he bred and raised racehorses. And I don't know how he found out about this little boy in Brownwood, Texas, who was believing God for a horse. Uh, we, we think we found out later that there was a guy who lives about 30 miles outside of Brownwood. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. But... Uh, Somehow he had known him and told him about this little boy who was believing God. And uh, <clears throat> this guy from Del Rio was a Christian, and he decided that he would give Bill a horse as seed faith because he had some big thing he was believing God for. And so he had told God, I'll give a horse to this little boy in seed faith for the miracle that I'm needing. And so he even dropped the horse off on the way through Texas. He was going to Oklahoma dropped the horse off one Sunday afternoon. I mean, you should have seen us. The whole family was just, I mean, we were yipping and hollering, not necessarily because of the horse, but because of the miracle that God had just done. And it was a beautiful Palomino, the first thing that he had told him. And um, we, we uh, went to church that night, pulled the horse in the horse trailer. Of course, the minute church was over, Bill had to have everybody outside to look at his new horse. And um, so... The next day, we got a call from the mother of a 15-year-old girl. She was in the service for the first time. And, um, of course, she heard Bill's testimony because he got up and gave his testimony. Now, her husband, the husband, was a new psychiatrist in Brownwood, and he was a confessed agnostic. He did not believe in God. And up until that night, he had had such an influence over the daughter that she never would go to church with her mother. The mother, uh, I think the mother had been to our church maybe once, because they had just moved there. Uh, but she couldn't get the girl to go with her. But that night, the dad was out of town. The little girl didn't have anything to do, so she decided she'd just go for something to do. Well, she heard Bill's testimony. She saw the horse, and she got home that night, and she told her mother, I can believe in a God like that. And so the mother called me and said, I've got to tell you about my daughter. She, you know, you can imagine how excited she was. Well, 
she started coming to our church. She accepted the Lord. She became one of our most faithful members. Uh, they, uh, she, she was in church every Sunday for months, but then they moved. And later, uh, one Sunday morning, I mean, we're talking a lot later, years later. One Sunday morning, there was a little young couple there with two children. And when it was over with, she came up to the front and she said, do you remember me? Well, I didn't. <laughs> and she said, I'm the girl that saw the horse and, and here she had married now and had two children. So she was still following God. Okay, two of the things that Bill had felt God told him had come to pass. It was a beautiful Palomino and in spite of our, you know, uh, skepticism, somebody truly had come to know the Lord because of the horse. But this horse did not like to be ridden at all. I mean, I, I tell you what, Jack and I both start, kept praying, Lord, why didn't you, it wouldn't have been any harder for you to have given him a horse that liked to be ridden. We don't understand why, why you gave him a horse that just, I mean, he did not want to be ridden. Bill would get on his back and he would run as hard as he could for the low-hanging trees and run under them to drag Bill off, you know. Well, we got to the point where we were afraid something, you know, he was going to really get hurt. And um, we just kept praying, saying, God, this doesn't make any sense. And we even tried to talk Bill into selling the horse. We said, Bill, it's just not worth it. Well, um, Bill uh, was steadfast. And one day he came in and he said, I think God has told me that he wants me to have that mare bred. And I remember thinking, oh, no, you know, more problems. But it was obvious from the moment that that coat was born that that was the horse that God had for Bill. And, uh, uh, but he had done it in progressive steps, you know. But that horse loved Bill, and Bill loved that horse. When it was time to break him for riding, we got an old rancher. Jack knew this old rancher, and he asked him if he'd come over and help Bill break the horse. And so anyway, uh, he was explaining to Bill what to do, you know, because uh, he said, now he'll throw you for a couple of times, but it's okay. Anyway, Bill climbed into the saddle ready, you know, really, and, and the horse just walked off and <laughs> rode all over, the, all over the pasture with Bill on the back, didn't even buck, didn't even attempt to buck. And uh, uh, there were so many times he'd come uh, riding by the house, and boy, the tears would just flow because uh, of thinking, you know, God, you're so good. You know, when you trust, you truly were not disappointed. Um, and uh, God's just faithful. Now, sometimes he, he's not faithful for me because I, you know, I, I don't do what I'm supposed to do. But if we'll do our part, God is so faithful. Now, there's an interim period where con constantly God is telling us that uh, he wants us to keep trusting. He's just don't, don't get disappointed. Uh, and truly, with that precious new horse, the time came we were not disappointed. Uh, several years ago, Angela was getting ready to go to the Philippines. She was going as a summer missionary. It's one of her early trips. And they had to raise their own money. There was a guy named Tim on the team. And he had already been asked to speak. He was older. And he'd been asked to speak at the Bible College in Manila. And boy, he was really counting on the trip. Well, he had done all the legwork to get his money together. And he had been confessing, God's going to provide my way. But when the first deadline came, he didn't have near as much as he needed for the first deadline. And um, boy, he got into so much disappointment. Angie kept saying, uh, she said she was real worried about him because she said he got so bitter. And the team kept telling him, hey, this is just the first deadline. You know, don't quit trusting. You're going to have your money. But he wouldn't listen, and he just kept saying, no, God let me down. The deadline has come and gone, and I don't care about that trip anymore. Well, school was over, and the team members all went home to their different homes to get ready for the trip. And someone from our hometown who had just joined our church, and she had quite a bit of money, she called us and she said, I felt like God told me there's somebody on the team that's not going to have the money, and get in touch with them because I felt like God told me I'm supposed to pay for their trip. Well, boy, Angie was so excited. And so she called, and uh, <clears throat> she didn't know where Tim lived, so she called the mission department. She said, get hold of Tim. We got his money, you know. And so somebody's giving him the full amount. And they refused. They said, no, he had a bad attitude, and we don't want him on the trip. Well, she begged him. She tried to do everything to get him to. Uh, she said he just acted out of disappointment. Just he'll be okay. Well, they refused, and uh, <clears throat> 
They said, no, we don't want him representing our school. Well, Tim, I don't think he probably ever knew that the provision had been made, you know, and I thought about that for a long time. I thought, you know, that was a classic case of disappointment coming between a person and God's provision. The money was there. It had been donated, you know, but Tim, I, I don't think he ever knew that God was faithful. And I thought, how sad, he'll go through life thinking God let him down. But, but I tell you what, the, the Bible was, I mean, he was very definitely had been told, trust, you know, don't give up. But he, you know, he gave up. Uh, when Angela and David married, they had their wedding at our house. Uh, the dinner was going to be in the backyard and, and the wedding was inside. This was on July 30th. I don't have to tell you that that's usually the, one of the hottest days in the entire year. It's practically always over 100 degrees. And so we were dreading the heat so badly that we had started praying a lot about that. I mean, every prayer had, uh, while we were getting ready for that wedding talked about the weather. And uh, <clears throat> we had friends in town, and even some had come from out of town to help me decorate. We had 300 guests who had already sent RSVP, RSVPs that they were coming. And um, this was the year, I don't, I, I don't know whether y'all remember, but this was the year... It was a horrible drought. I mean, it, we, we had not had any rain. And um, uh, we seldom even, ha uh, the year before, we had not had any, not even a shower during July and August. And this year, it looked like it was going to be the same thing. And so on July 30th, the wedding day, the darkest storm you could ever possibly imagine, uh, began to build up about early, early afternoon. And I remember looking out of the upstairs windows, and we had all these pretty round tables with pink tablecloths that went clear to the ground. And um, they were in a big, huge semicircle and um, uh, had huge baskets of flowers. One uh, of the girls had, on her way, coming from out of town, she came from San Antonio, and she had stopped at this florist that she knew and just bought tons of flowers. She got them at a really good deal. And so she had made those up and put them on each table. But they were literally being dumped, blown down the hill as fast as the women could chase, get them, bring them back, put a big rock and try to weight them down, you know. And um, the sky was black. We're not talking about a summer shower. We're talking about a storm. The trees were all, we had filled them with these little twinkly lights. And they looked like the wind was going to blow them completely out of the trees. In addition from that, we had not even heard from the band that was supposed to have been there at 2 o'clock. And here it was, 4.30. The wedding was supposed to start at 7. And we even had a friend who had told us that he was going to fly over in a plane and get aerial pictures of the wedding. But he said, I've got to have it perfectly clear. So I can't even tell you the mental pictures that was flashing through my mind. You know, I, I could see guests drenched to the skin, and, and then I could see no guests at all. You know, the guests not even coming. And we had dinner prepared for 300 guests. And I thought, where will we put them? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I couldn't put them in the house. We didn't, all the tables were outside. And so everybody was running around and they were saying, what are we supposed to do? What do you want us to do? Well, how was I supposed to know what to do? I, I didn't have any answers. So Jack and I closed ourselves up in the bedroom and Jack started praying and he said, Lord, this is our biggest challenge to date. The, the wedding for our daughter. And it... It is the biggest temptation in the world to be disappointed, but Father, we're going to choose to trust you and we're not going to be disappointed. And I knew giving in to disappointment and anger right at the moment would have been the easiest thing I'd ever done. Uh, but there was something about saying that, Lord, I'm trusting you with Angie's wedding and I'm not going to be disappointed, that it started just a little bit of hope started trickling up. And <clears throat> so after we had prayed this, Jack went over and lay down and took a, take a nap. Y'all know Jack. He went over to lay down and take a nap. And I said, what on earth are you doing? He said, well, if we're going to believe God and have a good wedding, I want to feel good enough to enjoy it. I thought, well, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm not that far. But from 4.30 until 6, the sky was black. I'm not, I mean, it was like dark. Uh, it looked as though the heavens were going to open. It looked like it was just going to pour rain. And uh, the wind was so bad that we had long since bring it brought in all of the flowers, all of the tablecloths. And, but right before the people started coming at six, that storm just went around. Within minutes, the band drove up. They had been lost. It didn't even sprinkle where we were, not even enough to mess up the grass. But that storm going west from us, it 
made the most beautiful sunset. We're up on the hill, and so the sun going down behind those storm clouds, it was absolutely beautiful. And I think the, the guests took more pictures of the sunset than they did of the bride and groom. Um, and uh, they were constantly getting up and running over to the edge of, uh, you know, to take a picture. And um, it was almost as if God had written his blessing in the sky. So I felt like I knew what Noah must have felt when he came out and saw the rainbow. That, that's almost how I felt when I looked over and saw those beautiful clouds. Because this definitely was a, a perfect reminder that those who trust in the Lord should not be disappointed. I tell you what, <laughs> you think that didn't hit me right in the face, you know. And the added blessing, that storm going over, had blown away all the mosquitoes. You know what it's like right after dark with the mosquitoes. We didn't have any mosquitoes that night. It had cooled everything down into the 70s, and we're talking July 30th. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, I, I just, all night, I was, I mean, the tears were just pouring. I couldn't stop them. And I was pushing the tears back, and everybody thought I was crying because I was losing my daughter. It didn't have anything to do with Angie. I kept seeing those miracle after miracle after miracle, you know. And I, I can't even begin to tell you uh, what I felt in my heart. And um, I, I just felt, felt like my heart was going to burst. Uh, now, this is a simple answer, but God's answers are so simple. But it's one of the most important and most life-changing truths that God ever gave us. It was so important. And I believe that's why it's in the word verbatim that many times. I was shocked at how many times it was in the word. Those who trust in the Lord should not be disappointed. Now, I'm going to end with this one example that you may have heard, but... Uh, it really makes me look bad, but it was a miracle. Uh, back during that period when Jack was between jobs, he had sold the Pepsi plant and he hadn't gotten a job yet. And we had started building on the house. And so I can't even begin to tell you how tight money was. So we decided, I decided that every time we ran out of something that I would just not replace it if we didn't need it, if it wasn't necessary. And well, I ran out of vanilla and I thought, I don't need vanilla. Well, it was several weeks went by and I started making a cake for this big thing, big to do that we were having at the church. And when I started mixing the cakes, I realized it was one of those that if you don't put vanilla in it, it's not good. You know, it just doesn't taste good. And we live way out in the country. I didn't have a car that day. So I sat down in the middle of the floor and I had a little pity party. And I just, the tears were just pouring. And I said, Lord, this is really abundant living. I don't even have any vanilla. <laughs> I was just having my little pity party. Well, suddenly I was so convicted and, uh, I can remember my face turned red when I, mean, I realized how ridiculous I was sounding. So I repented and got up, you know, and uh, pretty soon I, I had pretty well forgotten about it, you know. And uh, a week or so later, I was uh, helping this friend move. She was moving out of a large house. They were going into a smaller house because they were going to go off to school. And I was helping her carry up these small items into the mobile home. She was right behind me. And all of a sudden, she said, oh, by the way, could you use any vanilla? And I stopped and I thought, did God tell on me? <laughs> you know, and then I realized I hadn't told anybody about my little pity party. I hadn't told even Jack. And I looked around thinking that maybe she was kidding me. And then all of a sudden, she handed me a large man's shoebox. And it was stacked as full of bottles of vanilla and every kind of extract that you could imagine. You couldn't have gotten another bottle in there. And she just shoved it into my hands. And to this day, I don't know where she came up with all, all those uh, vanilla and all those extracts. But I just stood there looking at it. I was speechless. And it was as though God were saying, is that enough vanilla for you? <laughs> you think that's enough vanilla, you know? And I, I, I really felt like I could hear him laughing. Because I definitely believe that God has a sense of humor. I do believe that. But it's like he was saying, I clothe the hills better than Solomon himself was dressed. I feed even the sparrows. Will I not furnish you with all the vanilla that you need, you know? <laughs> but truly, those who trust in the Lord today shall not be disappointed if we'll just trust him and continue to trust him. But Father, I love telling these stories because, Father, it just reminds me how faithful you are to your promises. How faithful you are that if we trust you and we don't quit trusting and, and we refuse disappointment, that, Father, when we do that, then you always bring us through and, and we see miracles. And so, Father, I know this has been one of the most important things you've ever shown uh, to me and, and to, to my family. 
Father, I, I always pray that when I tell this message, Father, that people grab hold of it anew and put it to work because, Father, it works. And, Father, I, I'm always amazed when I realize how many times you put it in the Word of God. You evidently wanted us to really grab hold of it for you to have put it that many times in the Old and the New Testament. And so I just want to say thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. You're so good to us. We just love you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.